Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to wait just a minute and allow for a few more people to join the call before we get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andrew Sorensen, spokesperson here at CU Boulder, and I'll be moderating today's call. Some quick housekeeping items before we get started. If you have a question for the experts on today's webinar, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. You can start doing that now. We will do our best to get to all questions. If we do not get to your question, you can reach out to us at colorado.edu forward slash COVID-19. Also, our experts will answer your questions until the questions run out. If by chance we have no more questions prior to the scheduled ending of the webinar, we will end early. And as a reminder, today's call will be recorded. That recording will be added to our COVID-19 website. Lastly, I want to advise everyone that starting next week on Tuesday, February 23rd, we're going to pivot the focus of this weekly webinar moving forward. We will take turns each week between a faculty and staff campus Q&A and a student and family campus Q&A. Next Tuesday, February 23rd, we're going to begin with a faculty staff campus Q&A featuring Senior Associate Vice Chancellor and Chief HR Officer Catherine Irwin, Vice Chancellor for Infrastructure and Sustainability Dave Kang, and Senior Vice Provost Catherine Eggert. The next student and family campus Q&A will be the following week on March 2nd. On today's call, we have Chancellor Phil DeStefano, Campus COO Pat O'Rourke, and Provost Russell Moore. We also have with us Jennifer McDuffie, Associate Vice Chancellor for Health and Wellness. She's also heading up our campus pandemic response office. We have Laura Arroyo, Director of Housing Administration in the Division of Student Affairs, Catherine Eggert, Senior Vice Provost for Academic Planning and Assessment, and Mark Heyert, Police Commander for CU Boulder Police. I'll now turn it over to Chancellor DeStefano, who will get us started today with some opening comments. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. And I'm pleased to welcome back our students, our faculty, and our staff to campus and to the community. We're excited for in-person instruction. For many students, your college experience is built on personal interactions that come with in-person learning and living in the community. We want to maintain our planned in-person instruction for the remainder of the semester, but that is up to all of us and how well we follow state and county health protocols. We are proud of the efforts of our campus community, as well as our city, our county, and our state in continuing to observe mask mandates, physical distancing, and COVID-19 testing protocols for the safety of everyone. Each week, the state updates the Colorado State COVID-19 dial. Boulder County is currently at yellow level which is called Level of Concern. Pat O'Rourke, our Chief Operating Officer, will talk more about that in a minute. We have heard from students that the pandemic has had a significant impact on mental and emotional health and well being. That is consistent with national statistics. One third of college students nationwide seeking mental health support in 2020 said it was related to the pandemic. While following public health orders is important, it is also important to get involved, find safe ways to connect with friends and reach out to support services when needed. The university has a variety of events and COVID safe activities 
available on campus and virtually. Buffs care about each other. And now more than ever, we need to support each other, be good neighbors and follow the recommended safety advice of our public health agencies for the safety of all of us, our friends and our families. And now I'd like to turn it over to our Chief Operating Officer, Pat O'Rourke. Pat. Thanks, Chancellor Stefano. And I just wanted to echo his thoughts that it's wonderful to have uh, students returning to campus for in-person instruction. I taught a class in person last night and it was really wonderful to have that experience again. Switching to COVID and what our current status is, I'm gonna share my screen so that I can share some information with the community. But, okay. Bill, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen? Or I'll assume that we can. You're good, it's on there. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the first place I wanted to start was by, as Chancellor Stefano let us know, um, the state has revised the metrics for the COVID dial and that that has been done and really changes two things. Number one is that the changes increase the number of people who can be infected with COVID in a community for a status change. Um, while at the same time, reducing the rate of positivity that results in a status change. These are actually more sensitive numbers that allow us to get a sense as to where the disease is likely to go rather than what the current status is. And that's really valuable for us to be able to predict. As Chancellor Stefano said that currently Boulder County is in level yellow. And as you can see, in terms of the metrics that the state looks at, the number of cases has been steadily declining. For those of you who joined us in the fall, there were the numbers were well into the red numbers, um, up above 250 or 300 cases per 100,000 people. It's currently at 116.1, which is really great progress. And Boulder's positivity rate is in the blue status. So we're hopeful that as the semester progresses that we will move from yep, level yellow into level blue. The place where a lot of students have questions though is what does that mean? Because we will be offering in-person classes. We won't be shifting educational instructional modes throughout the course of the semester. And the real thing that we need to be clear about is that even when we're in level blue and level yellow, those personal gathering sizes are limited by public health order to be no more than 10 people from up to two households. And that those continue to remain a public health order that the campus will be enforcing along with the partners in public health. The definition of household is for those students who are living off campus, if you're living in an off campus residence, those people in your residence are the members of your household. For those people who are living in residence halls, for example, though, your household is your roommate or those people who live in the shared uh, living situation in which you're in. This continues to remain somewhat restrictive, but it's also really necessary in order to prevent COVID rates from rising in the community as we return to campus. We know that social distancing is one of the most valuable tools that exists in order to be able to pre prevent the spread of COVID. And right now, Boulder County is about 55% on social distancing. That's where we were in the summer. And you can see from the slide that it went significantly down in October. That was the period of time when we had our significant spike. And so we need people to remain vigilant, continue to wear masks like Chancellor Stefano talked about, maintain that social distancing. That's going to be our greatest tool that we can continue to use to prevent COVID infection in our community until vaccination begins to um, take more root in our population. From a average number of cases, you can see that that number continues to decline in Boulder County, an average of uh, 55 new cases per day. That's great news. And you can see that the rates of infection in that 18 to 22 year old population has also declined. We saw a little bit of an uptick this past week, which is probably to be expected as 
we've had a number of students return from their communities of origin to the campus, but we wanna make sure that that uptick bends back down as quickly as possible. For our tools to be able to address that, I'd encourage everybody to download the Buff Pass and the app. We've really improved that over the course of the last several weeks so that now it's very easy for a student to be able to check in each day, to be able to select where they're going and to be able to make sure that they're safe to come to campus. The bus path app will give you information on testing, where to go, where to get your results. When results come in, it can show you what they have been over the past several tests to be able to let you know what your status is and to be able to provide really good instructions about what you should do in the event that you get a positive test result. That testing is really important. Um, we're continuing to mandate that for those who are within the residence halls. And our expectation is that all students, faculty and staff who are coming to campus will get tested so that we can make sure that we know what's going on within our community. We have the capacity to do upwards of 20,000 tests per week. And we wanna make sure that we're using as many of those as possible so that we have the most up-to-date information and can do what we can to protect our community and our campus. We've also expanded to the point where we're gonna be able to offer mobile testing during the spring semester. And that you can see that on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, that testing will be available on Pleasant Street, just east of Broadway and between the Hale and Koenig Alumni Center. And that on Tuesday or Thursdays and Fridays that it will be available on Athens Street at Athens North. So if, if you're not coming to campus, please use those uh, testing opportunities that are available because we want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to get tested. Finally, we've been asked some questions about vaccine and how that's occurring. I put up the prioritization for vaccine distribution throughout the state. And the green levels are the ones that are currently in progress. Uh, highest healthcare uh, risk workers, other first responders and Coloradans over the age of 70 were prioritized. Now they're in that population of 65 to 69, the K-12 education community and some other uh, people who are frontline workers. That's the focus at the moment. What's really significant though, is that for the majority of our student population, they're really looking at phase three for that vaccination to reach the student population. And until then, it's gonna be the tools such as social distancing, mask wearing, and continuing to take the right steps to keep our community safe that are really gonna make the difference. There are thousands of vaccine doses that are getting administered each day in Boulder County though. This shows the number of first and second doses. But the thing that's really important is that the majority of those doses currently are going to that 70 plus population. We know that those are the most vulnerable population within the city and county of Boulder, as well as across the United States. What we're already starting to see is a significant decrease in hospitalizations um, that are related to COVID. And it's our hope that as those hospitalization rates and the most vulnerable get vaccinated, that will improve our conditions within our community and lead to even more opportunities for social interaction and a more normal experience. We can all do our part on the campus by making sure that we're doing the right things, really paying close attention to what those limits are on personal gatherings um, and doing what we can to protect our neighbors. But we're excited to have everyone back. Hope that you have a great semester and I look forward to answering any questions, but would now turn it over to Provost Moore. Thank you, Pat. And as the chancellor said, we've returned to our blend of in-person, hybrid in-person and remote instruction modes as planned. And I'm really gratified to see the campus come alive with our students, faculty and staff. This means that every class will be taught in the instructional mode that was listed when students registered for classes. So for example, if you signed up for an in-person class, uh, that class will be taught in person. If you signed up for a remote class, that class will stay remote. If you're enrolled in a hybrid class and are unsure about when to attend class in person, please contact your instructor. We're also here to help students who have, health who have a health condition or disability that might impact their ability to return to in-person learning. Uh, those students should contact disability services to see how their needs can be accommodated. Tomorrow, Wednesday, February 17th, is the first of our two scheduled wellness days during the spring semester. 
The second wellness day is scheduled for Thursday, March 25th. No classes, makeup classes, or review sessions are to be scheduled on these wellness days. Instructors have been advised not to have exams or major assignments due the following day, February 18th or March 26th. We want our students to have a real day off, day off and to rest and to recharge. As many of our faculty and students return to the classrooms, it's important to once again note that we did not have a single known case of laboratory or classroom transmission of the virus. It's also important to note that all of the health and safety protocols applied on campus last fall are equally effective at preventing the spread of the new COVID-19 variants that have, been, that have been emerging this spring. We're confident that there is no increased risk when our COVID prevention protocols are followed. As students and faculty begin to plan for the coming summer and fall terms, we want you to know that we will continue to act in accordance with city and state guidelines around the pandemic. We'll need to keep offering a blend of in-person, hybrid, and remote classes as long as social distancing is called for. That said, all of our colleges and schools have asked to increase their number of in-person classes for the fall, and we plan to use our classroom space creatively and safely to make sure that happens as best we can. We're working on announcements for summer and fall registration, so look for those plans later this month and again in March as we solidify the details we can share. Students should check the Buff portal for any holes they might have to ensure that those are cleared before their enrollment window uh, to ensure a smooth registration experience. I'm also pleased to report that our COVID-19 dashboard, which provides public data on tests, test results, and campus isolation spaces in use, has been given an A rating across nine indices of quality by the website, by the website We Rate COVID dash Dashboards, which rates college and university COVID dashboards across the nation. This is a great tribute to our faculty and staff who work to develop and improve the dashboard for all of us. Before I turn this back to Andrew to start our Q&A, I want all of our faculty and graduate students to know that they have my thanks and admiration for all of the creativity and flexibility they put into their teaching, research, and creative work activities. They continue to break new ground in their fields and in working with our students. Thanks too to all of our students and their families who, who have adapted to a large set of requirements and temporary restrictions that have been necessary to get us through these past 11 months. So thanks again to all of you and now back to Andrew. Thank you very much to Chancellor DiStefano, our campus COO, Patrick O'Rourke, and Provost Moore. We want to give all of you the maximum amount of time to answer your questions. Again, if you have questions, please use that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we will be prioritizing questions from students and family members today. Our first question that we have in here uh, looks like it's for Provost Moore, or potentially Laura Arroyo. The person says, my sophomore son, chose to live at home this year, his friends who are currently living in CU housing have told him that he will not be able to move back to CU housing next year as administration has prioritized freshmen and sophomores for the dorms and Bear Creek. They say there'll be very little room for upperclassmen and probably no chance to get back on campus for anyone who's not currently living on campus. Thoughts there? Yes, I'll take the first stab at that. Uh, unfortunately, that's largely correct. Uh, the number of housing slots we have available for upperclassmen is actually severely limited, uh, particularly given some uncertainties that we have about uh, how the fall will actually uh, play out. Um, but I would encourage you to work with our student affairs personnel uh, who can help arrange for uh, off-campus housing, and uh, we will do the very best to accommodate your student. Um, thank you so much. And it's good to see you all today. And just to add on um, just a little bit from a housing perspective, um, historically, the majority of our rising second uh, junior and senior students do live off campus in uh, the greater Boulder community. And we work closely with off campus housing and neighborhood relations to ensure that there's um, space in the off campus setting for all of our students who are looking for housing. Um, and I would say currently we have a great number of housing opportunities available to students. 
And so I want to assure the, the parents and the family of this student that we will work closely with you to, uh, to support your student if they do need to live off campus. What I would say also um, in the question in regards to Bear Creek. Um, Bear Creek is our apartment style uh, living experience on campus and that space is primarily sophomores, juniors, and seniors with some space for transfers and that continues to be our priority. Nothing has changed from that. Um, residence halls will continue to be primarily first-year students um, but our housing model continues um, to remain the same priorities it has always been. Um, so if you have any concerns or questions about housing please work with our on-campus housing um, occupancy management staff, as well as our off-campus housing staff um, to look at what's available for you. Thanks so much. Thanks for that clarification. A question here for CEO Patrick O'Rourke. With only 6,500 surveillance tests last week and 1,400 yesterday, it seems like campus is far short from the roughly 25,000 that might be needed to have all those venturing on campus tested. Is there any increased effort to get off-campus students to participate in surveillance testing? So I appreciate the, the question. Um, like the, the questioner asked, um, we want to be able to increase those rates. And so we are working to try to increase those numbers. As I talked about earlier in my comments, uh, one of the things we're doing is we're putting up mobile testing in order to bring testing out to that off-campus student population. We've also been working with Boulder County Public Health to be able to talk about how we can have testing better for our congregate living situations off campus. And that we're also working on building out incentive programs and other things in order to encourage the off-campus student population to continue to test. As I described earlier, we do expect, um, and this is a change from where we were in the fall, that students who are coming to campus for any purpose, whether it's for class or because they have work responsibilities, to become part of our testing program and to join that. And so we will be continuing to send out our messaging in order to make sure that uh, we're meeting that expectation and using the capacity that's available. All right, thank you. Question for Chancellor DeStefano here. Is the university working with the state to change the vaccine status of our faculty? Thank you, Andrew, and, and thank you for that question. Uh, about a week and a half ago, the presidents and chancellors of uh, community colleges and four-year and research universities met with the governor's staff uh, to talk about this issue of faculty and staff, uh, faculty who are teaching in person as well as staff who meet on a regular basis with students in person, uh, possibly getting um, their vaccination uh, earlier than within, with the general population, as, um, as Pat mentioned. And uh, there are two issues. One, of course, is making sure that there's the vaccine supply. And two, uh, getting the numbers of individuals, of faculty and staff who would have that close contact with students. Uh, we're providing that information now to the state, again, not just the University of Colorado Boulder, but all institutions. And one of our recommendations, if you remember the chart that, that Pat showed of uh, that general population in the summer uh, getting vaccines uh, vaccinated, uh, if there's a way to carve out from that general population uh, faculty and staff who uh, meet face-to-face -face with students, uh, we haven't achieved that yet, but that's our recommendation. And as I said, the state has asked us to provide uh, numbers from all institutions across the state uh, so that the state has an idea of how many individuals we're talking about. So that's a work in progress and hopefully we'll know more um, as, the, as the semester proceeds. Andrew, a quick follow-up there, um, which is really grateful for Chancellor DeStefano and the higher ed leaders who met with the state officials last week to talk to them about that. But it's really important to reinforce what Provost Moore said earlier, which is we've worked hard to be able to make sure that the classroom environment is a safe environment for those who have in-person teaching responsibilities. Um, we will be continuing with all of our safety protocols and that we have found this past semester through our contact tracing and all of the other epidemiological work that the classroom environment 
has proven to be a safe environment. Um, so that at the same time, we're working to be able to see if we can get prioritization for those people who are teaching in person. Um, don't want people to assume that until vaccine arrives, that it's not and has not been a safe environment. We're dedicated to making sure that we can, can maintain that throughout the course of this semester as well. All right, thank you. A question here for Provost Moore. Is there any inclination as to when admissions campus visits might return to campus? I can't give you a terribly specific answer on that one, but I know that we are working with our uh, COVID response team uh, to get to the uh, point where we can provide those in-person tours as soon as possible. Um, so I don't want to make promises that I can't keep, but I, I can I can assure you that you should expect that guidance within the next two to four to six weeks. Um, but we're doing our very best to accommodate uh, safe uh, and comprehensive on-campus visits. All right, thank you. A question for CO O'Rourke. Does CU Boulder's testing pick up COVID variants and are there increased risks to campus safety as a result of new COVID variants? So the answer to the first question is yes. Um, all of our tests so far are able to pick up the COVID variants. Um, they're similar in genetic structure so that uh, those are detectable. Um, and that was really good news. The answer to the second question is, is there increased risk? What we know about the COVID variants is that they appear to have a greater degree of infectivity, meaning that they're more transmissible. So more than ever, it's important to do those things that will prevent the virus from transmitting. Um, that, as Provost Moore said earlier, if you wear a mask, if you social distance, if you avoid those large group gatherings, just as those were the most effective things that could be done to prevent the spread of the traditional variant of the disease, that's the exact same thing that will work to spread the, to prevent the spread of the variants as well. Um, so that this doesn't change our strategies, but naturally we wanna be attuned to what's going on. And if we see an increase in cases, um, we're gonna be able to, we need to be able to adjust to make sure that we're engaging in those practices that will keep the campus and the community safe. All right, another question for uh, CEO O'Rourke. If a student has been approved in their home state to receive the coronavirus vaccine and have not gotten it because they had to return to school in Boulder, is there a place you recommend they go off campus to receive one with their home state documentation or do they have to be approved by the state of Colorado additionally? So my understanding of this is that different states have different prioritization um, as to how they might have been categorizing people any distribution within the state of Colorado um, would need to be done against Colorado's criteria. If someone has documentation from another state that would have established their eligibility um, such that they have a particular health condition that would might make them more susceptible, that they should discuss that with the local public health authority so that they can make sure that they are prioritized um, in the Colorado prioritization as well. Thank you. And another question here, uh, potentially for CO or Rourke or Commander Hyatt, would you please update the community on the investigation regarding the delivery of DVDs and envelopes to sororities and fraternities? The information circulating is that it was part of a scavenger hunt. I would welcome Commander Hyatt's uh, Yeah, thank you, Pat. Um, yes, so we worked closely yesterday and throughout the evening with our partners at the Boulder Police Department. Um, our investigation is uh, showing that this was intended to be a scavenger hunt um, and that uh, the unattended uh, impacts of concern to the community um, were not um, actually warranted in this case. So um, from that standpoint, um, we really do thank the community for their participation. That actually is what helped us uh, come quickly come to a resolution with this and to be able to determine 
um, what the outcome was, uh, that there wasn't an ongoing situation. So um, thank you to the community members. Um, I'd also like to point that out because without them, um, you know, being able to bring us information in a timely fashion and helping us and the Boulder Police understand the dynamics of this, um, we wouldn't have had the hope that we did to get uh, to that conclusion. So um, at this point, that's where we're sitting with it. Um, and there's some additional follow-ups occurring, but um, at this point, uh, nothing more um, is taking place with uh, DVDs or CDs being distributed. And we've met with those individuals. All right, thank you, Commander. A question here for Laura Arroyo or potentially Jennifer McDuffie. COVID social restrictions have been particularly cruel for freshmen living in campus housing, this person says. What actions are the university and in particular the residence hall staff taking to support students' needs for meeting fellow students, promoting socialization, and proactively combating mental health issues during a period of isolation and loneliness? Andrew, thank you for asking that question. And I'll um, speak a little bit to the mental health and then turn it over to my colleague, Laura. Um, this is such an important question, both for our own campus and our off-campus students. And we know that in the pandemic, we have really seen an increase in mental health concerns. I encourage everyone, including our faculty and staff, to do a daily assessment, to check in on resources such as our Let's Talk program, where you're able to drop in without an appointment and talk with clinicians, looking at some skill-based workshops that are unlimited um, and available to all students, regardless of where they live. And then additionally, really asking um, the, the hard questions. Is this something that I need to talk with someone or talk to um, with someone? And if you're asking that, then please go and realize that you're not alone. There are so many services and resources here at CU. Not only do those resources exist, but I also think it's important to share the programming and the engagement. We're hearing from a lot of students that they want to go out and meet with people, um, whether it's their RA, whether it's an event or activity. And we have a lot of engagement, both in person, hybrid, and some virtual that students can connect with. And I think it's really critical that that's all students, not just our own campus ones. But I do want to answer the question and speak directly, Laura, around the residence life and the programming and the support from the RAs. Thank you, Jennifer. I just want to reiterate, uh, this is a very difficult time for students. Um, and it's important that students make sure that they speak up, they speak out, that we ask difficult questions to make sure that we're taking care of each other as a community. Um, what I do want to say too, for um, students that are feeling isolated, we're increasing our in-person opportunities. We've heard that um, both from our off-campus students and our on-campus students. So we're working to support both populations. Um, for our off-campus students, we're increasing those opportunities both on campus as well as within the greater community where they live. And that's, that's an exciting change I think that students can look forward to um, for those that live within the Boulder community. And of course, we're doing that in-person um, very safely safely, we're thinking about physical distancing appropriately, um, making sure that we're, we're keeping to size limits of, of groups and, and making sure that we're uh, keeping safety at, at the forefront of our mind. Um, for our on-campus population, um, our student staff and our professional staff in the residence halls are working hand in hand to ensure that we have in-person opportunities for students. And what I will say is that the same, same things around safety that we're considering for our off-campus population, but also what we're hearing from our on-campus students is that they're still also trying to form connections with one another. So that comes both from in-person activities and social events, but it also is making connections with each other in the residence hall, and our RAs are there to support that. Um, so we've heard you, and, and we're taking your thoughts into consideration, and, and are very excited about the offerings that we can provide this spring. Can I jump in on that too? Sure. So... Earlier, I talked a little bit about the COVID dial and what it meant to move between the different statuses. Um, the personal gathering limitation, which would be a social gathering limitation and how it applies to household. That doesn't change much as you move between the different statuses. 
But what it does is it allows the university to be able to sponsor more events, to be able to, to do more programming. So one of the things that we want to be able to do is make sure that we stay within level blue, level yellow, because the more restrictive it gets on the COVID dial, the fewer opportunities we're able to provide. And so this really is going to be an important part of supporting the student experience is we can do more to be able to create those events and create the opportunities. If everybody works with us on being able to maintain the safe campus environment, that's really the place where we hope to be able to do it. The other thing that we've heard from a lot of students is the importance of being able to maintain their in-person class experiences and students who have just started going back to classes in person this week. We really want to avoid the disruption that we had last semester when we had the big spike in cases. And so trying to maintain the continuity of the educational experience um, has proven to be really important from a social perspective as well. So we're focusing a lot of time and attention on making sure that we're doing the right things to increase the amount of, of opportunities that we can offer both in classroom and outside of the classroom to, the, to our students. Wonderful, thanks so much. A question here for Chancellor DeStefano, is the university set yet on a plan for the fall, particularly for having more in-person classes and a more traditional experience for students? Andrew, as uh, Provost Moore said, at this time, we're working on both summer and fall uh, for scheduling. Uh, my goal is definitely to have more in-person classes uh, in the fall, uh, along with, um, as you can imagine, maybe with some of our, our very large lecture courses to do those um, in a hybrid model with both remote and in-person. Um, but again, it's, it's going to take us uh, a few more weeks in this semester uh, as Russ pointed out, to work on uh, summer and fall. Uh, but our goal is to have uh, more in-person classes uh, fall semester. All right, thank you. Another question for CEO O'Rourke, is CU offering COVID testing to families of students? Yes. Um, so anyone with a Buff One card can come and bring members of their household um, to any of the testing sites, you can check them in with the Buff One card. The results get turned around within that 24 hour time period. And thanks to the work of Jennifer McDuffie and her team, uh, we've expanded our ability to be able to provide those notifications back um, and individual test results. So, um, like I said earlier, we have the capacity to use that surveillance test to protect the community and we welcome everybody using it. Fantastic, thank you. A question here for Provost Moore. Uh, the housing shortage appears to be connected to an expected increase in freshman enrollment in fall 2021. Why has CU chosen to increase freshman enrollment at this time? Yeah, great question, Andrew, and I will rely on my colleague, Laura, Laura Arroyo, to help me out with this answer. But in, but in reality, uh, enrollment's not increasing, it, it, the best case scenario, it's being restored toward pre-COVID levels. I think one of the issues that we're faced with is not having absolute clarity on what the fall will look like. Um, we do need to, uh, taking into account that safety is our first priority, making sure that housing is at the appropriate density and that we leave a, a housing stock available for isolation should we need it in the fall. Uh, so uh, let me just make sure that we're not talking about uh, a huge increase in enrollment. In fact, we would be restoring it optimally towards pre-COVID levels. Uh, and let me turn over this over to uh, Laura if she wants to provide some more detail on that. No, Provost Moore, that's perfect. That's very correct. Um, we really are trying to make sure that our first year incoming students um, have as, as safe of an experience on campus as we can, knowing that we need to plan conservatively for the fall. And so that means that we need to hold adequate space for self-isolation, which is causing a little bit of the housing challenge. Um, but our numbers um, are looking really like they will be in previous years. Um, it's not a significant increase at all to our first year student population. Thank you very much. And this one's uh, right back to Laura Arroyo. Since our current freshmen really missed out on 
things like in-person orientation, welcome week, socialization, going to football games. Will there be anything special for them this fall, some type of sophomore orientation for things they missed last year, like learning the fight song? That's a great question. Um, we're hearing significantly from our rising second year students um, that they're missing the opportunities to form the connections of what they thought their traditional first year ex experience should be. Um, one of the changes that I think is really exciting that we're making, um, when we look at Bear Creek, where most of our rising second year students, our juniors and our seniors will live, we're placing our juniors and seniors together in building B of Bear Creek so that we can house our rising second year students together in the building A in Weber Hall. Now that's a real change and, and a really great opportunity for us to ensure that our rising second year students are living with each other so that they can build those connections um, that I think are really important that they, they've missed out on this year. Um, and then the other things I will say for our fall welcome, our rising second year students, all of our students are, are welcome to attend those events and to participate in all of our in-person as well as our virtual opportunities. Um, that's for all of our students. We want to welcome everyone back to campus. Great, thank you. Another question for CEO O'Rourke. Given the vaccine timeline estimates student age group might be eligible for vaccines in the summer, do you anticipate vaccines may be available for returning out of state students in August? I do think that's a realistic possibility. Um, we will be working with the state and we are uh, an approved distribution point for vaccine um, so that we will be, I actually think that we will be able to vaccinate some of our student population before they go home um, in, the, in the spring and that in the fall we'll be able to support vaccination as they, they return. Um, obviously one of the things that we're hopeful for is that as the one dose vaccines come online, um, that will make the task of vaccination amongst a student population easier. Um, so this is a evolving situation, but we intend to be available to support vaccination for the student population as soon as we can get the dosages. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question here for Jennifer McDuffie or potentially Senior Vice Provost Catherine Eggert. For an off-campus student to attend an in-person recitation this afternoon, is it mandatory that they be COVID tested by today? Yeah, I, I can take that one and Jennifer can help me out with the testing part. Uh, go to class, you do not have to get tested before your class today. And Jennifer can tell you when to get tested and how to get tested um, as soon as possible, but you don't have to do it before you go to class. Thank you, Dr. Eggert. Um, I agree. I think that there are a few different places that you can go for testing. And ideally we would like for students and faculty and staff, obviously, to test at least once a week. We do have students and others who test every time they come to campus because it's a free resource and it's available. We have multiple testing locations as um, COO O'Rourke mentioned earlier, and we are available um, during the day without any kind of appointment. And also I think it's important to recognize that the Buff Pass does ask you before coming to campus to assess your symptoms. And if you have any symptoms, if you answer yes to anything, please do not come to campus. Please um, go and see if um, there's drop-in appointments, there's appointments that can be scheduled at medical services, please do based on your symptoms. And if you think it might be COVID, get a diagnostic test um, immediately. Thank you. And our next question, looks like it's for Commander Hired. Can CU designate an area to lock bikes in an enclosed area with a buff pass access? I happened to visit my other child's campus and saw open garage, cage areas, and bikes vertically hung and student passes as their access point. I'm happy to send photos to the appropriate contact or on-campus police. 
Yeah, so um, we have a few items that we recommend for our students and affiliates that are using bikes on the university. One of those, um, if you're concerned about your security of your bike, and we all are, is to use a uh, U-lock. Um, that's the most effective means of deterring uh, bike theft. And then also parking their bikes um, in uh, access areas controlled by the Environmental Center. And we can probably put a link up in this somewhere with access uh, more information for the e-center. Um, there are two specific secured bike areas, one located near the University Memorial Center, the UMC on main campus, and another one located out on East Campus um, near the ARCE building. Both are secured uh, in closed cages. Um, and you can find a link uh, in, in the eCenter's website that specifically uh, gives you the ability to um, request access. It is on the uh, student's buff one card and it's part of the, the door access for those. So there are a couple of options there as well. All right, thank you. Another question for CEO O'Rourke. Will there be more guidance from HR on how they will document information on staff eligibility for vaccines? For example, although CU might know someone's age, how could they know if they have two or more high risk conditions? So we would, if there are people who are in the prioritization based upon their job eligibility, that's something that we would be tracking through our HR systems in order to be able to notify people that they're eligible. If there are employees because of their health conditions that have eligibility, that is something that they need to address first with their care providers who can certify their eligibility based upon those health criteria. We don't have the ability to be able to access employee health records from their own providers to be able to certify their eligibility. Um, so that they should begin that work with their own health care providers so that we can get them into the system for, for vaccination. Right. Another question for CEO O'Rourke or potentially someone from Student Affairs. As the weather gets warmer, will there be outside tents for studying like there was in the fall? Actually, I would... Uh, I haven't asked that question yet. I would assume that that would be something that we could... Uh, do again, but I'd want to check with our facilities folks. And I appreciate the question because I hadn't thought about it because it is so cold right now that the notion of being outside in the tent scares me. Um, but that as the spring gets warmer, uh, we know students will want to take care of the, the outdoor environment. And Catherine, did you have any thoughts there? Yeah, I have some information. So we're not planning on installing tents in the spring. Those of us who've been in Colorado for a while know that March and sometimes April are our snowiest months and snow is uh, and tents are a bad combination. What we have done is we have uh, vastly increased the number of study spaces that students can sign up for. And uh, so if you go to the C website and, and do a search for find my study space, you'll find uh, ever more uh, uh, spaces you can sign up for for study and Wi-Fi access uh, to participate in classes remotely if needed. Great, thank you. A question for CEO O'Rourke. If staff have had the COVID vaccine, do they still need to participate in the monitoring testing? Uh, yes, we want people who are participating in the testing to uh, continue even if they've been vaccinated. There's still, and I don't understand all of the science, but there is some concern that people who've been vaccinated still could potentially be transmissive. Um, so we would want people to be able to continue with the testing even if they, they have been vaccinated. Provost Moore, am I getting that right? You, got, you have it absolutely correct. Uh, unfortunately, we're learning new things every day. And one of the things that's not been clinically resolved yet is to uh, the efficacy of each of the, each of the approved vaccines on uh, preventing uh, transmission. So we're just erring on the side of caution. And again, the top priority for the campus, as the chancellor alluded to, is uh, the health and safety of our faculty, staff, and students. All right. This one, I 
think we might have answers from multiple people, potentially CEO O'Rourke, Jennifer McDuffie, or Laura Arroyo. Is there any hope there will be a change that uh, could define a quote unquote household for residence hall students to be those on your floor as the kids already share a bathroom, living space, and so many are isolated as single students in a double room? So the short answer is we don't know. Um, and the reason behind that is that those definitions are not something that are CU generated. Those are definitions that have come to us from the state. What we anticipate is that there will be changes in the COVID dial during the course of the, of the semester. Um, and that that may be an issue that uh, CDPHE would be willing to explore um, but that we don't have the ability to redefine that ourselves, um, but that they know of the concern that we've raised about the impact that that definition has had upon our student population. Okay, thank you. A question here for Provost Moore or potentially some of the student affairs professionals on the call. I'm trying to confirm that March 25th to 28th is a four day weekend for students. March 25th is Wellness Day. March 26th, is campus closed? Uh, it is not a four-day weekend for uh, the students. And let me defer the detailed answer to Katherine Eggert. Thanks, Russ. So Thursday, uh, the March 25th, is a Wellness Day for students. So there are no classes being held on that Thursday. Campus will be open and students will be able to access other kinds of services, but we won't have any classes. On the following day, Friday, classes will be held. So students should come to class on that day. The campus is open. We do have a staff holiday on that Friday, but uh, staff are working with their supervisors so that, uh, that uh, the student services and faculty services on campus will have staff available. The staff who are working on that Friday will be given an alternative day for a holiday instead. So not a four day weekend, come to class on Friday. That clarification. Another question for CO O'Rourke, will vaccines be required for all students in the fall? If a student doesn't want the vaccine, will they be able to attend classes? So. Oh. What I'm going to say for the moment is I don't know the answer to, to that question. Um, currently, the vaccines are in a state where they are still being approved under an emergency authorization and that we don't believe it would be appropriate to require somebody to have that vaccination while it's in that status. Colorado law also has some ability for people to choose whether or not to, to receive vaccination. So we need to, to look at all of the legal requirements and the ethical requirements before we would make that decision. And I wouldn't feel comfortable pre-committing on that today. Okay. Another question for CEO O'Rourke and uh, potentially Jennifer McDuffie. What about vaccines for older students with health issues? Will CU provide vaccines to those that use CU as a primary care provider? For clarity, this person says they are high risk and they don't know where they should get a vaccine. Wardenburg is their primary care provider. So the short answer is yes, we will do that um, for those people who have conditions that make them eligible under the higher prioritization scales, they should be come and make an appointment so that they can be approved uh, to be able to get vaccinated according to their particular condition. But we can support students who have a uh, need to be vaccinated because of their health condition. Thank you. Looks like this will be our last question for today for Chancellor Stefano. Is there any discussion about permanent lessons being learned by COVID-19 and any practices, policies, or innovations that might continue after the pandemic is over? Thank you, Andrew. And uh, since this is the last question, let me just thank uh, the faculty and students and parents and, uh, and our staff who uh, 
been with us for this past hour. Um, but let me begin by saying, you know, one of our, our campus imperatives is to be one of the top um, innovative and entrepreneurial universities. And certainly from this pandemic and what we all believe is that uh, there certainly are opportunities that emerge from challenges. And we've had enormous challenges uh, this past year. And yet our faculty, our staff and our, our students have really arisen to those challenges. And so what we look, you know, we'll be looking at, uh, for example, our Center for Teaching and Learning and what our faculty have learned there about using technology to enhance pedagogy uh, that may be part of, of what we do post COVID. Uh, we wanna look at ways that we, you know, engage our, our, our students, our faculty and staff. And so we'll be looking at the successes that we've had during COVID-19 and how we've worked, how we've taught, how we've learned, uh, how we engage and taking some of those best practices and using those best practices in a post-COVID environment. So although I don't have specifics for you right now, it's something that um, the campus is working on to make sure that we provide the best educational experience uh, for our students. And that may involve some of the, some of the ways uh, we use pedagogy uh, these past 12 months. So the short answer is yes, uh, I don't have the details right now. All right, thank you very much, Chancellor. Again, we want to advise everyone that starting next week on Tuesday, February 23rd, we are going to pivot the focus of this weekly webinar moving forward. We'll take turns between a faculty and staff campus Q&A and a student and family campus Q&A. Next week, again, February 23rd, on Tuesday, we're going to begin with a faculty and staff focused campus Q&A, and we'll feature panelists, Senior Associate Vice Chancellor and Chief HR Officer Catherine Irwin, Vice Chancellor for uh, Infrastructure and Sustainability Dave Kang, and Senior Vice Provost Catherine Eggert to answer questions from faculty and staff. The next student and family campus Q&A will be that following week on March 2nd. These updates will occur on a weekly basis throughout the spring semester from noon to 1 p.m. Mountain Time, with the last webinar scheduled for Tuesday, April 27th. If you have more questions or you'd like to see additional information, you can do so by visiting our COVID-19 website. Again, that's colorado.edu forward slash COVID-19. There's a chat at the bottom right-hand corner of that site where you can ask questions. Boulder County Public Health is also hosting community briefings this year. Every Wednesday at 3.30 p.m., BCPH's agenda for those meetings moving forward to provide updates from Boulder County Public Health leadership, updates from public health professionals on current topics, such as vaccine testing and data, as well as updates from local partners. Lastly, the City of Boulder does once a month briefings on Thursday of every month. Those are from 3 to 4 p.m. Mountain Time. Thank you all so much for joining us today and your questions. We will now end today's call.